Good morning for everyone. We are uh, very uh, happy and pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Olivier Bonaventure <coughs> as keynote speaker for our symposium. <coughs> Uh, Olivier Bonaventure is professor at Université uh, Catholique de Levin at Belgium, where he leads the IP Networking Laboratory. Uh, professor Bonaventure has contributed to uh, several and various networking protocols, like BGP, uh, TCP, uh, Multipath, uh, IP version 6, Lisp, and Quick. Uh, he is very active within the ITF and the lab, has uh, produced uh, um, many open source implementations of important protocols, including uh, TCP, IP version 6 segment routing, Lisp, and more. Uh, he is the current editor in chief of SICOM uh, CCR and the main author of the open source computer networking, principal protocols and practical practice ebook. He is co founded the TSR company that pioneers the deployment of hybrid access networks. Welcome again, Professor Olivier Bonaventure. Many thanks. Thank you. I will have one. So thank you for the introduction. I guess the mic is working? Yes. So um, today, my objective is to try to convince you that we can do something better uh, in our networking stack to make it really extensible. And the presentation will be organized in uh, five parts. So first, what I will try to see is that I will look briefly at the evolution of the networking stack. Then I'll show you one example of extensibility with IPv6 segment routing to make it programmable. Then, although <laughs> we believe that TCP is not extensible, I will show you that this is not completely true. And then we'll show how to extend routing protocols and how to extend quick uh, the recent protocol which is being pushed by Google and others at the ITF. So first, let's look at TCP. TCP is not that young. Uh, LCN is, is 44. And TCP is probably older than LCN. If you look at just the evolution of the TCP stack in the Linux kernel, I looked at what happened between uh, 1993 and today and the number of lines, non-command lines, that exist in the TCP stacks of Linux, you saw that it starts from a few thousand lines to almost 100,000 lines today, and this complexity continues to grow. Despite of this complexity <coughs> of the Linux TCP stack, it remains very complex to deploy at a wide scale uh, network extensions. So if you look at what has been happening with TCP, we see that there have been many extensions that were proposed in the last century, TCP window scale, TCP timestamp, TCP selective acknowledgments, explicit congestion notification, and we had to wait until 2010, 2015 to make them fully deployed. And if you look at the timestamp option, for example, the timestamp option is still not supported by Microsoft Windows, while this, is, this was proposed in the previous century. And if you look at multipass TCP that was standardized six years ago, it's deployed by Apple, but still not deployed everywhere. So why is it so complex to deploy extension to networking protocols? I guess the main reason is that is because we still believe that uh, network protocols are black boxes. And we'll still reason about the network protocol as being a black box. And we interact in the black box with the higher layers through an API, for example, the socket option for TCP, but other APIs for other protocols. We have interactions through the lower layer with an API. Again, in the kernel, we look at how we will interact with the IP layer, for example, for TCP. And then we discuss with the ITF or other standardization bodies when we want to change the protocol messages. And all this takes a lot of time to make any change to the protocol and to its implementation. And if you look at what's happening in an implementation and how you can tune it, well, typically, protocol implementations that we have done for many protocols is that they provide some knobs that you can use <coughs> to tune the implementation. So you have socket options for TCP. You have syscontrol variables. You have some modules in Linux that provide some flexibility. But there is very, very limited extensibility, which is built inside all protocols. So let me show you a few examples on how we can improve that and how we can have much, much more extensible protocols 
looking at some recent work that we did in the lab, but also which uh, affects uh, different <coughs> types of protocol from the network layer, uh, the TCP layer, the transport layer, and the routing protocol. So first, IPv6 segment routing. So segment routing is a new flavor of a very old technology. So it's the return of source routing. So if you remember the early days of networks, there was source routing for IPv4, and then source routing was killed <coughs> because it had security issues. It came back in IPv6 and in a, a revision of MPLS with a variant which is called segment routing. So what is segment routing? The idea is, came from MPLS, and in MPLS, when MPLS was designed in the, in the late 90s, uh, you might remember that w during the design of MPLS, people saw that they wanted to reuse the ATM switches, but they didn't want to make <coughs> any change to the routing protocols that were OSPF and others. So they invented LDP protocol, they invented RSVPT to be able to create labeled switch paths through the network. In the end, this created some complexity, complexity in the network itself because you had to implement new control plane, pro, new, new control plane protocols. Sorry. With segment routing, the objective is to simplify the control plane and to get rid of LDP for MPLS, RSVPTPT for MPLS, and change the intradomain routing protocol, so OSPF or ISIS. And the idea is that inside the intradomain routing protocol, each router will advertise its loopback address inside the routing protocol. And once you know the loopback address of the routers, then you can build paths through the network that are source routed paths. So for example, and you place inside each packet the intermediate ops through which the packet needs to go to reach the destination. So here, I first have a path from three to seven, which goes from R2 to R7. And this path will go via router three, and then it will move to router seven. It's also possible to do more complex paths, for example, eight, four, uh, seven, three, and then the packets will follow that path automatically through the network, which means that with segment routing, you can create any path you want inside the network, and the cost is that you will put the path inside the packet as a source route. That's the ID solution. So this works by using an IPv6 extension header. Uh, nothing really special, but what's interesting is that during the development of IPv6 segment routing, there was a nice proposal which was called network programming. And the idea of network product programming is that <coughs> you would like to be able to run inside your routers some middle boxes that would provide some specific functions on a per packet basic basis when they see a specific packet coming with a special destination address. And the idea is that the router will advertise the function that it supports as an IPv6 address, and the low order bits of the IPv6 address will correspond to the parameter of the function. So it's possible when you send the packet inside the network that you for force the packet to go through a specific router, and on this specific router, the packet will be processed by a special function, and inside the packet you have provided the parameters of the function that you want to apply to the packet. And so, how can we implement that? So we did that in two steps. First step is that we added support for IPv6 segment routing in the Linux kernel, and this was one PhD in my group. And then the second question was, how can we, once that we have the IPv6 segment routing implementation in the Linux, in the, in the Linux kernel, how can we implement network programming? So how can we implement specific functions on the routers? Can we use socket, socket options, kernel modules, it turns out that the best approach <coughs> is to use eBPF. I was wondering how many people in the room know what is eBPF. Who has already heard of eBPF? Not that much. So let me tell you what is eBPF. That's, some, that's a technology which is part of Linux since 2014. And eBPF is a virtual machine. It, was, it is an extension of the virtual machine that was designed by Van Jacobson and uh, Steve McCain when they designed TCP dump. You have all heard of, of TCP dump and libpcap. And this virtual machine implements a risk instruction set, about 100 instructions. And it implements a very simple processors, which allow you to run uh, bytecode. And this bytecode is compiled into native code, for example, Intel code, when you run it on an Intel machine. And what's important is that this eBPF code 
you, ten, you can attach it to the running Linux kernel at specific point inside the Linux kernel. So inside the Linux kernel, you can add new bytecode that you have written as a user, and this bytecode will be executed by the kernel at specific places inside the kernel. Of course, the kernel does not allow you to put anything inside the kernel, because if I give, it, give this to my bachelor students, they would completely break the Linux kernel, so there are verifications. So they check that you, you don't have infinite loops, they check that you use the stack correctly, and the main use case are to be able to do monitoring, so there is lots of work with the perf tool in Linux that allow you to do lots of debugging and lots of monitoring. It's also used by SecCom to, do, <laughs> to verify the system calls that some applications are allowed to do. So we have that in the Linux kernel, and now that we have that in the Linux kernel, it's possible to use that to implement network programmability. How do we do that? We have an application that will, through the BPF system call, inject some specific bytecode inside the Linux kernel. This bytecode will be verified so that it does not contain infinite loops. And once the bytecode has been verified, it's part of the kernel. And the BPF bytecode that, that you have written, which is part of the kernel, will be executed by the virtual machine. And it will interact with the application through a map. And it will be able to call some specific functions of the segment routing implementation. And that's the trick that we use to be able to implement network programmability. So when we receive a specific packet, we have a way to identify a function, and this eBPF function will call some specific part of the segment routing implementation. And what does it do? There is some performance cost. So compared to native implementation, compared to native code, we lose 15 to 20 percent of the performance when looking at packet forwarding rate but we have much more flexibility. So there is a trade-off between performance and flexibility, and here the trade-off is in favor of flexibility. So with that, you can do improved measurements, you can implement hybrid access network, you can do faster failure detection, and there are lots of features that you can do, and what's nice is that if you are in a network that uses routers with segment routing, then you can divide your own eBPF code that will run on the routers and will implement some per packet for specific uh, programming, fu programming functions. So this was for IPv6 segment routing, a very specific use case. Let's move in the stack and look at TCP and try to make TCP extensible again. First, eBPF is a nice way to debug performance problems because it allows you to attach specific bytecode to functions that exist in the Linux kernel so that you can <coughs> uh, detect any problem. And if I have TCP performance problems in the university, what can I do to debug these problems? Uh, as a university professor, I, the easiest solution is to collect packet trace and ask one PhD student to spend a few months to look at the problem and to explain me what is the problem and maybe fix the Linux TCP implementation. I guess most companies will not do that. In companies, they will look at SNMP MIPS, Netstat, tools like SS, and if you do that, you have very limited visibility on the type of problems that you can debug. And so either you lose in visibility or you lose in scalability. So what's the approach that you can do with eBPF? In eBPF, you can attach an eBPF probe, so a, a small eBPF code, to any specific function inside the Linux kernel. So we can track the retransmission of SYN packets. We can track what happens when there are out-of-order packets in TCP, because if you have out-of-order TCP packets, then you can collect statistics in the map, and you can detect that you have reordering problems in your network. If you have to look at the TCP dump trace to find the reordering problems, this is a bit boring, because you have to process lots of data where there is no reordering issues. And that's something that we have implemented, and we have, what we have done is that we have implemented a special daemon that uses these eBPF probes to collect statistics about what TCP sees and then export this information to a collector so that we have full visibility of what's happening in the TCP stacks of uh, the campus network. So just to show you an example, just if you want to track the scene retransmissions, and the scene retransmissions, they will affect the performance because every time you have to retransmit a scene in TCP, in most implementations, you wait one second to retransmit the scene. So if your first scene is lost, then user experience is affected a lot. And to be able to do that, what you need to do is that you need to attack some, attach some specific eBPF code to specific functions in the Linux kernel. 
And this eBPF code will create the statistics and then export it uh, to a daemon that sends it by using IPFX. Just as an example, so we implemented that in our student lab. And so we have 30 uh, PCs that were running for one month. And we just look at what's happening in the scene with transmissions. And just by looking at that, we saw that in our network, there was a huge difference in the number of scene retransmissions between IPv6 in red and IPv4 in blue. And so the rate of uh, scene retransmissions goes up to 0.1% in IPv4 on average, while it's close to zero on IPv6, except on one day where we had some issues. We have not completely found the reason, but at that time, we, the IPv4 was between brackets protected by a firewall, and IPv6 was between brackets not protected by a firewall. So we expect that most of the retransmissions of the scene were due to have problems of overload of our firewall. So sometimes you can detect things. Uh, and what's nice is that if you want to detect something else, you just rewrite another EPB, eBPF code, and then you detect another issue inside your stacks. But let's go one step further. And <coughs> to go one step further, I need to introduce you to TCP BPF. So TCP BPF is a set of patches that were written by Lawrence Brackmore, who is working at uh, Facebook. And what he has done is that he has added uh, specific hooks, so specific functions that BPF programs can call inside the Linux TCP stack. And so you have a specific function that you can call when there is a TCP connect when you have an active establishment or a passive establishment, and you can specify socket options. And more importantly, you have read and write access to some TCP state variables, so, such as the run trip time, congestion window, and other key parameters of the TCP stack. And the main use case at Facebook is that they want to be able to configure the, the TCP stack of different applications under the control of the Facebook system administrator. So the system administrator is writing the eBPF code that will configure the TCP stack for a specific application. So a, a video streaming application will have a different TCP stack than Facebook Messenger uh, uh, server application. So <laughs> we have the TCP implementation. And inside the TCP implementation, you have callbacks that are triggered by specific events, such as creation of a TCP connection, you have some helpers, so that are uh, TCP functions that you can call from the eBPF codes, and then we exchange the TCP messages. So what can we do with that? One possibility that goes beyond what Facebook has done with the TCP BPF implementation is that it's possible to use that to implement new TCP options. So there are TCP options that have been proposed within the ITF, but have not, not yet been widely deployed or not, not widely implemented. So one example is a user timeout. The user timeout option is a way for the application to tell the Linux stack, the TCP stack, what is the maximum uh, retransmission timeout that the application accepts. And if the timer goes beyond that value, then the connection should, should be stopped. And there is a TCP option which allows a client to send that information to the server so that the server knows the maximum uh, retransmission timeout that it should use. This part has never been implemented in Linux. With eBPF, it's possible to implement it Easily, we just need to change a bit uh, TCP transmit SKB, TCP option writes, and you do a small changes to the receiver. What's the impact to implement this TCP option <coughs> by using eBPF? From a performance viewpoint, there is a, so this is performance measurements on a 10 gig interface. The baseline is a bit more than 9.4 gigabits per second. And when you insert, pass, or modify an option, you just go slightly below 9.4 gigabits per second, so the performance impact is very low. There is some more CPU utilization, but not that much. So there is some cost of doing eBPF, but not that much. So it's possible to implement new TCP options. So if you want to have your own TCP option in your data center, or in your sensor network, or in your own network, it's possible to do that, so you can extend uh, eBPF uh, TCP by using eBPF by yourself. So we have defined new delayed acknowledgement strategies. We have defined new pass managers for multi-pass TCP. And there are lots of things that you can do by using eBPF so that you have a base TCP stack. And on top of this base TCP stack, then you have extensions that are implemented as uh, options in eBPF. So transport layer. Next, 
control plane protocol. Can we do the same in routing protocols? Let me just ask you a question about routing protocols, and the question will be valid for BGP and OSPF. Let's imagine that you are working for an ISP. You have a nice ID that would require a small change to BGP or OSPF. How long do you need to make sure that your small change will be implemented by your favorite router vendors? One year? Three years? Five years? Ten years? Let me show you an example, very simple example. BGP large communities. So in BGP, you have the communities, which is an attribute, which is part of BGP, and which allows you to tag routes. So the BGP communities were designed when the AS numbers uh, that were given by RIPE and other registries were 16 bits long. And so the BGP community assumes that each community is composed of a 16-bit AS number and a 16-bit value. As the internet was growing, we have replaced AS numbers from 16 bits to 32 bits. And so the BGP community should be replaced for, from 16 bits to 32 bits. First proposal, 2002. It would be nice to have 32 bits BGP communities. 2009, there is a lucky AS that receives a 32-bit AS number. No implementation of BGP communities that, allow, that are usable for this AS. 2016, there are a, a bunch of operators start to complain very violently and say, well, it would be good that the ITF it's, it was 14 years ago, we had the first draft, nobody was interested by that. But now we have a growing number of ASs that are using 16 bits, uh, the 32 bits AS numbers, and we should serve them. So September 2016, now there is a push from operators. They managed to get the RFC in six months. I don't think how you can imagine how to get an RFC in six months within the ITF. My experience is that it's, it's impossible, so they managed to, to get that. And in the end, they got the implementation one year later on major router vendors. But in total, nine years before using BGP communities. And you have the same example in OSPF, in BGP, in many things. And there are many operators who would like to be able to change some small part of BGP or some small part of OSPF just to have a network much more flexible than what they have today. What can we do? If you look at what's a Routing implementation, whether it's BGP or, F or SPF, basically, you have the routing protocol that you can see as a finite state machine. It maintains some data structure, so the rib and the neighbor's context and other information. And then the way that you can configure it is by using the CLI, NetConf, SNMP, so it's a very limited way of configuring the protocol implementation. How can we improve that? So the solution that we propose is the following. So inside the protocol implementation, we add an API which allows to access the data structure, mainly the RIB, and the context which is maintained by the protocol implementation. And then on top of that, we add virtual machine which allows the network operator to implement its own extension to the protocol. So what are the extensions that the network operator could implement? It could change a state in the protocol state machine. And so you specify a new a uh, bytecode, a virtual machine, that will replace an existing state in the finite state machine of the protocol. You can add new transitions. You can add new states and new transitions to the protocol. And if you can do that, then you can completely change the protocol and tune it to what you really need inside your network. And this is, we do that by using what we call plugin, which is bytecode which is attached to the existing routing protocol and uses an API to interact with the data structure which is maintained by the protocol. And let me show you how it works on a, on a simple example. So again, we are using eBPF for that, but not the eBPF version of the Linux kernel. So the same risk virtual machine, but a user space implementation. And this user space implementation has some um, specificities is that 
uh, we <coughs> have a verifier which is far less strict than in the Linux kernel. So in the Linux kernel, you have a limit on the size of the loops that you can uh, implement by using eBPF code. We got rid of that, and we allow the eBPF code that we inject inside the protocol to have a heap, and we use the heap to share data between different eBPF codes so that we can write a program that, that has a data structure and that can maintain a data structure. But same technology as the one that exists in the Linux kernel. So just as an example, let's look at a BGP implementation, but this is valid for OSPF as well. In a BGP implementation, typically what you do is that when you receive a BGP update message, you have a function that will process the BGP update message, and part of the, part of the process of this BGP update message once you have processed the BGP update message, you will typically call the BGP decision process. And this BGP decision process is the algorithm that ranks the BGP routes and selects the best one for a given destination. And so you have the code of the BGP decision process, which is in a separate function. So what do we do? And how can we first allow a network operator to monitor what's happening inside its BGP router? For example, you would like to know how long it takes on your router to run the BGP decision process. To do that, that's pretty easy. What we do is that we simply add a virtual machine at the beginning of the function that calls the BGP decision process, and this virtual machine will simply collect the current time. The virtual machine returns, we run the BGP decision process, and at the end, of the function that executed the BGP decision process, we have another virtual machine that just computes the difference in time between the start of the decision process and the end of the BGP decision process. And this can be stored in our heap, and so we have that information which is available if we want to be able to compute how much time it takes to run the BGP decision process from one destination to another. So if we want to have statistics about the computation time of the decision process, we have that information. And we do that only in the parts of the BGP code, which is of interest for us at this time inside the network. And we can run it on multiple routers inside our network if we want. Second example, as a network operator, I'm not happy with the BGP decision process that was decided by Cisco. I consider that for me, the multi-exit discriminator must be before the AS pass rule. I can try to fight with Cisco and ask them to change the BGP decision process in five years, or I just decide to replace the code of the BGP decision process with my own version of the code. Or if I want to run the BGP decision process that would be based on, for example, using BGP communities that I use in a specific way inside my network to compute the geographical distance between routers and do a ranking based on the geographical distance between routers, I just can do it. I just need to replace the BGP decision process. How can I replace the BGP decision process? That's easy. I just replace the function that runs the BGP decision process with a virtual machine that I provide inside the code. And this virtual machine will be executed every time the BGP code calls the decision process. So instead of the standard BGP decision process, I run my own BGP decision process. There is some performance penalty of doing that, but I gain a lot of flexibility in doing that inside my network. So my network becomes much more open thanks to that. So <coughs> basically what we have done is that, so you have a protocol that maintains some state, some data structures that exposes an API. And inside this protocol, inside this implementation, what can we do? Basically, we can attach different types of eBPF code that we call plugin. We can attach eBPF code at the beginning of a function. This is what we call the pre-eBPF uh, <coughs> plugin. And this plugin has read-only access to the protocol data structure. We can attach code at the end of the execution of a function. This is what we call post-plugin. And we can also replace a function. And when we replace a function, we have write access to the a memory which is maintained by this function. So we can completely replace the function. And there is a shared memory that we can share between different plugins if we want to 
uh, as we have shown in the BGP monitoring, if you want to compute, to rely on data collected at the beginning of a function and data collected at the end of the function and do a comparison, for example. So just one example. Uh, if you work for, BG for BGP with a network operator, many of the things that they do are implemented by using BGP filters. So the BGP filter is the code which is executed in a BGP implementation to decide whether a received BGP update is accepted or rejected, and more import importantly, to modify some of the attributes of the BGP message. So for example, this is in the BGP filters that you will attach BGP communities, or you will remove BGP communities, or maybe you will change the AS pass to do AS pass rebranding or whatever. And inside <coughs> Uh, rotor implementations, there is a specific syntax that you can use to specify the filters that you want to use. Let me show you an example. Is that on a Cisco rotor or on Quagga, if you want to implement a BGP filters that will re reject all routes that are originated from an even AS number, then what you have to write is that you have to write a very special <coughs> set of regular expressions that will match the odd, odd AS numbers. And if you do a, a simple mistake in one of these regular expressions, you have a BGP filter that completely explodes. Now, what we do is that since we can replace any function by C code, we can implement that by using C code. And so we can implement our own filter by our own BGP filter by using C code. And here in the example, the C code is simply to look at the AS number of the last AS of the past, whether it's even or odd. But if you would like to maintain a table, and so you, have, you would have a rank of table from ISPs that you like and ISP that you don't like, and then you prefer one over the other, and you put different communities, whether you like it or not, and depending on what's already available in the BGP routing table, you have the full flexibility of C code to be able to implement your own BGP filters. And this is very, I, I, say, I would say this is very important for the flexibility of the network operators. So you have the full flexibility of C to write that. <laughs> what's the cost from a performance viewpoint? Again, there is no free lunch, so we looked at what's happening when we send 200,000 routes from a BGP simulator, which is called ExaBGP, onto a router, which is running on a standard PC. If we use the classical BGP implementation, it takes about 16 seconds to accept these 200,000 routes and to process them. The number is not that important. Now, what happens when we add an eBPF code to count the number of routes that we have received? So we just add monitoring. And if we count the number of routes that we have received, we lose about 30% of performance. So we are about 30% slower because we are running eBPF code for each BGP update message that we receive. So there is a small cost. And then if we filter the, the routes from the even AS, from, uh, we filter the routes from the even ASs, of course we only accept 50% of the routes because we have 50% of the route from, from even AS and 50% from other ASs. But overall, we have 33% uh, loss of performance. So this flexibility is available, is possible in BGP, it's possible in OSPF. I guess it could be used in mesh networks, in wireless networks, in many types of networks where you would like the network operators to have lots of flexibility and you would like to rely on a basic infrastructure which is uh, stable and efficient. So you could, for OSPF, for example, you could say that I want to have OSPF, which is able to distribute link state attributes, but I don't care about the processing of the link state attributes, and all the link state attributes could be processed by eBPF code that are written by the network operators. Last example is how can we add plugins and provide extensibility to Quick. So first, let me go to Quick, and let me bring you to the Quick revolution, which is ongoing. So you all know that Today's stack is typically the application web video streaming and many other applications on top of HTTP2, on top of TLS, on top of TCP, on top of IP. And <laughs> all this is getting replaced by the application that would interact through Quick, 
via UDP. So we are getting rid of HTTP2, TLS, and TCP, and everything is being replaced by a single protocol which is being finalized by the ITF, which is called QUIC. And this push is, this is being pushed by companies like Google, Facebook, Cloudflare, and others that believe that <coughs> by putting everything inside a single protocol that runs on top of UDP, we will have much better performance than what we have with our uh, layered solution with HTTP2 on top of TLS and on top of TCP. So basically, we got rid of layering. But what's, what, what's more important, what are the benefits for these companies like Google, Facebook, or Cloudflare, is that until now, when you use HTTP2, TLS, TCP, they depend on TCP, which is part of the operating system, TLS, which is provided by system libraries, HTTP2, which is implemented in the browser, and they have to juggle between different implementation and make sure that the interactions with TCP on Windows, on Linux, on Mac OS, on iPhone, on whatever works more or less reasonably. When they move to Quick, what they do is that what they expect is that they will have a single implementation that they will provide themselves that will interact with the minimum that they can expect from the operating system, which is UDP. And so it makes <coughs> uh, the operating system uh, less relevant and less important in the performance of the web. And so it allows the content distribution companies to control all the networking stack on top of uh, UDP. So what can we do to make QUIC really extensible? So if you have followed QUIC, it has been standardized for the last three years. It's supposed to be finished in November, but it was already supposed to be finished last year in November. So we don't know in which November it will be finished, but maybe it will be finished in one November. So what are the key ideas? Same as for the routing protocol. So we take a user space implementation of eBPF as a virtual machine, and we put it inside Quick. And the idea is that we want a quick implementation to be dynamically extensible. We expose a set of callback functions and helpers, and which is, goes beyond what we have in TCP. But what's nice in Quick is that at least the design of Quick is really flexible, and so you can add new types of frames inside the Quick protocol. And since it supports multiple streams and everything is encrypted, there is no problem with middle boxes, and you can use Quick to distribute lots of different information. And we use that so that we can exchange the bytecode that corresponds to the eBPF plugins over the Quick connections. So you can learn over your Quick connection what is the eBPF code that the server would like you to use. So you can dynamically learn what are the extensions that you would like to implement. So let me show you how it works. So we have a client that interacts with a server. We assume that we create the quick connection, and the quick connection starts with an initial message, which, say, which is a client hello. And we simply extend the client hello to list the eBPF bytecode, so the eBPF extensions that the client supports. And let's assume that the client supports multipass. The server would like to monitor the traffic from the client. And there is no monitoring today inside the Quick protocol. There are discussions on allowing network operators to see more about Quick, <coughs> but basically, there is one bit available in Quick, which is called the spin bit. And we have written an, an extension that says, well, it's natural for the network operator, for the server provider, to monitor what's happening on the client side, for example, to look at reordering. And so we inject specific code on the client to monitor the reordering on the client side. So the server tells the client, hello, I would like to add monitoring capabilities to this connection. On the client side, we don't have monitoring, but we can request it from the server. And so I will send, now the connection is encrypted. We send the plugin request. And we tell the server, please send me the monitoring plugin so that the next time, I will be able to use the meeting plugin. The server replies with the bytecode, and this is only one of the stream of the, multi, of the quick connection. So the bytecode is sent, and in parallel, you are downloading data from the server or sending data to the server on, as regular. This is just another uh, stream of the quick connection. And on the next connection between this client and the same server, 
the client will tell that it supports monitoring so that the server can decide to use the monitoring extension. And now that the server has decided to use a monitoring extension, then you can exchange specific frames that are the stat frames where we provide information, additional information to the server about the round trip time that has been observed by the client, the, the reordering that has been observed by the client, and lots of information that were not part of the official design of Quick, but it makes Quick much more extensible and much more usable by CDN, much more usable by researchers who would like to do specific experiments. So there are very different use cases with uh, uh, Quick by the extension. Let me show you three of them briefly. First use case, monitoring. So we have done in Quick the same as what we have done in TCP, so adding lots of statistics about various events that exist in the quick stack. So number of bytes, packets sent, received, lost, out of order, uh, changes in the round trip time, changes in the congestion window, blocking of the, from the application. But what's important is that inside a quick connection, you can export the data locally, but you can also export it back to the server by sending specific frame over the quick, over the quick connections. And this is done with about 500 lines of C code and which is 86 kilobytes of bytecode that you need to download from the server. It's also possible for the client to send specific plugin to the server if the server accepts to use plugin coming from the client. Second use case, multipass quick. So there are multipass extensions to quick like there are multipass extensions to TCP. Uh, the quick working group at the ITF doesn't want to discuss about multipass quick extensions until they have finished version one of quick, which will happen one November. Uh, and what we do is that basically we have implemented multipass quick as an eBPF extension on top of a single pass quick, which is PyCo quick from Christian Wittema. And basically it provides the same performance as multipass TCP, except that you download it automatically from the server starting from, from your implementation. So during the last 10 years, we have been pushing multipass TCP a lot in Linux, in iPhone and stuff like that. Getting it deployed is very difficult here. Multipass quick, if quick is deployed, we have about 2,000 lines of C code, 140 bytes, 40K bytes of bytecode that we need to exchange. And with that, we can push the multipass extension on top of a client that does not support it. Last use case for what erasure connection. If you look at previous networking conference, you have seen extensions doing forward erasure correction for many protocols for the last 20 or 30 years. <coughs> starting from ATM and a lot like that. Uh, with forward erasure correction, the client needs, the sender needs to do lots of computation to compute parity codes or more complex codes so that the receiver can recover missing data from the redundant data that was sent by the sender. And this requires a lot of computation. So this is CPU intensive. And we have done an implementation that supports a very simple, very naive solution, which is XOR, and a more complex one, which is random linear code. And this, again, is 2,000 lines of C code, 200K bytes of bytecode, and this can be downloaded automatically from the server and added to a live implementation. There is some performance cost. So if you start quick in the servers that we had, it was about one gigabits per second. When you add monitoring, there is a very small overhead. Multipass goes one more overhead, and then forward erasure correction, since it's much more computation intensive, then there is more overhead. But this is not a surprise. What's important is that you have uh, much more flexibility. So in PQuick, we have, uh, of course, if you download code from the server, you need to trust the server, and there are some safety and some security issues. So how do we deal with that? Uh, we deal with that from a system viewpoint. The plugins are isolated from PQuick and each other. And this is done by using the eBPF virtual machine that validates some of the code which has been pushed by the, uh, in eBPF code. And we also propose a, a system that certifies the plugin. So it's possible to have a certification of the plugin so that when you receive a, a plugin, you can verify whether the plugin was certified by a trusted entity. And we have also looked at uh, using techniques from software engineering to verify that the eBPF code that we write is terminates correctly and does not contain infinite loops that would break the existing connections. And there are lots of details available about that. So with that, 
I think I've covered um, a wide range of protocols and looked at their extensibility. And I hope I've convinced you that uh, eBPF, but maybe other techniques, might be useful to reconsider the way we want to extend protocols. So in IPv6 segment routings, they provide with eBPF, you can support network program programmability. With TCP, you can collect accurate measurements, but you can also update key algorithms and support new TCP options. You can make BGP more flexible with eBPF filters. You can do the same for OSPF. In Quick, you can go one step further because you can distribute the bytecode that you want to use to extend the connection on a per-connection basis, and this makes the protocol truly extensible. So, but there are some next step, is that if you look at what's available with these eBPF extensions and what can be done with these eBPF extension, I think it makes sense to reconsider the way we design protocols. So we tend to design protocols in a way that we try to put as much features as possible inside the protocol. But then the, pro the protocol becomes very huge, complex. ITF takes years or more to be able to specify the protocol. <coughs> if we have extensibility that is included from day one inside the protocol, we could focus our effort on designing a core protocol, which is very minimal, but which is extensible. And so we put inside the protocol the core function that are really important. So for TCP, this would be reliability for quick. Maybe this would be reliability. For OSPF, this would be the distribution of the OSPF LSAs. But not the support of 20, 22 different LSAs, because these two 22 different LSAs, they can be implemented as plugins on top of that. So if you do that, then I think you can improve the way we design protocols so that they are, they are both extensible, easier to reason about, uh, easier to implement, and uh, easier to tune. Of course, if we want to go in this direction, there are some research challenges that, are, that remain open. So we have seen that there is some performance penalty of using a VM when you are extending a protocol. So you lose a few percent, a few tens of percent of performance depending on the use case. Is it acceptable or not? Maybe on the client side, if you slow down your iPhone by 10%, I don't think you will lose a lot. If you slow down the server by 10%, it might be important on some server, on some use cases. But we have just used one available eBPF implementation. It's probably possible to efficiently tune that implementation or use another virtual machine like WebAssembly. Uh, in the long term, what would be nice is to have independent implementations of an extensible protocol so that I have two implementations of Quick from company A, from company B, and both implementations support the same plugin. Because if they support the same plugin, then we can open a market for the, for the development of plugins that are extensions to different protocols. So you could, you could think of the protocols as being the equivalent of a microkernel in the operating system community. So you have a base function that you can extend by using eBPF code. And then from a software engineering viewpoint, uh, we want to make sure that the protocols that we design, specify, implement, deploy are working correctly. So it's good to be able to validate those protocols and to validate the extensions. So if you have a set of extensions for a protocol, you don't want extension A to completely jeopardize extension B. But how do you design a theory or how do you design tools that allow you to check that there is no conflict with two different implementations and two different extensions. And I think this is open, but if we can solve these issues, I guess we could have much, much more flexible and much more extensible protocols in the next five years or in the next 10 years. And with that, I thank you for listening to the keynote. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor uh, Levy, for this uh, nice and great presentation. Okay, if you have any question. That's a pretty interesting idea, but I'm just, so as far as I understood, as long as a client can talk to a server, they can negotiate whatever protocol they like, as long as they're sending messages in a kind of internet format that is not thrown away by the routers in between that are not 
concerned here. I'm just wondering when I'm picking up this design point, which simply says at least two endpoints can negotiate their protocol in some some kind of, of uh, um, uh, interval, you could say. So how should uh, should then the new internet be designed to allow such a thing? Is the old one good? Should be a lot of stuff being thrown away, like all the options, all the, what is needed to for the backbone, and what do we leave for such kind of protocol negotiations? So I, I, I think the protocol negotiation is good for the end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. And it's good as well for the control plane. But in the control plane, you would not have a negotiation, but you would have uh, extensions that are provided by the network operators. But you still need to have a substrate that allows you to exchange packets. And so the substrate to exchange packets remains to be uh, simple. And then on top of that, you can do whatever you want. So you could also imagine that, uh, for example, you have TFTP today that allows you to uh, bootstrap a firmware and to download a firmware. You could imagine that from TFTP, you bootstrap TCP, which is much more efficient from a transfer viewpoint. And then from TCP, you bootstrap TLS or whatever. So maybe it's possible to uh, try to think of what is the minimum protocol that you need to add. And from that, how can you build the entire stack just by downloading all the bytecode that you need? But I would need uh, a large group of PhD students to be able to, to do that. <laughs> So thank you for, for your talk. Um, I guess the question is, since now we are able to do transport layer in the user space, uh, isn't it easier to have like every application comes with its own transport layer in, in the user plane? And when we install the Facebook app or the Netflix app, we come directly with with the, with, the, with the transport layer of Facebook and Netflix and not install bytecode uh, online during the connection phase and uh, all that stuff. So wouldn't that be easier that we say, okay, transport layer is no, no, is no longer a networking problem. We, it's, it's an application layer problem. And the guys who develop application, they just do their own transport layer. Yeah, but then maybe we can think that um, standardizing protocols is not anymore necessary. Yeah and that everybody should have proprietary protocols, <coughs> and that we should remember the, what we had uh, 30 years ago, where we had uh, IPX, DexNet, uh, Novel, Netware, Microsoft, whatever, and every company has its own stack, and this was a huge mess. Uh, do we want to have a Facebook stack, Google stack, Netflix stack, and whatever? I'm not sure. But maybe I'm getting old, but I'm not sure that it's a good idea to have <coughs> each its own stack because this creates their own specific problems. And if you look at what's happening in TCP and if you look at what's happening in the Linux TCP implementation, so the Linux TCP implementation is standardized and it's um, used by many of these companies, Google, Facebook, Netflix. Uh, a few years ago, what they would do is that they would take the Linux TCP stack, tune it and change it a bit for their own purposes. And so each their own TCP variant of Linux. And then you had the Facebook variant, the Google variant, the Netflix variant, and they were diverging. And so it was impossible for Facebook to benefit from the improvement that Google were, were bringing to TCP. And in the end, after a few years, they decided to merge everything. And they tried to use the latest version of the Linux kernel because they benefit from all the fixes from the community. And I think in the networking stack, it's the same. So if you do your protocol on your own, you have your biased view of the networking stack. And you don't see some problems that your competitors are looking at. And if you all use the same, pro the same protocol, then you will benefit from the improvements that are done by the community. If you use your own proprietary protocol, then you will be blind. And after some time, you, you might get a competitor that just do something completely different from you, and then you go bankrupt. <coughs> so I think it's better to work as a community and to share the improvement that we do. And sharing bytecode could be a way to share improvements. And then you could also see the bytecode as a way to do a prototype and to do tests before you include them in a live implementation, in the, a native implementation. So as a first step, as an operator, 
if you want to have an OSPF extension, you implement it at bytecode. You show to your vendor that it works well, but there is a, a, a decreased performance. And then you can convince your vendor that it should implement it in a native way. So it doesn't mean that everything will be eBPF bytecode, but there is a way, there is a spectrum of possibilities. <clears throat> yeah, actually, your idea of uh, designing extensible protocol for TCP or other is really good. But uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, have you thought about incorporating blockchain inside the quick stack or something? Because, I mean, then you will be able to deal with security and, uh, you know, inter-process communication much efficiently. I Thanks. Haven't Honestly, I haven't checked uh, blockchain, so maybe it can apply to the certification of the plugins. Maybe not, but I haven't looked at blockchain, but maybe someone has an idea. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, looking at your uh, last point, which is um, the tools and techniques to validate, validate plugins, not only termination, but other types of automata automated proofs, I was thinking of um, the, the background people in telecom uh, had when they started um, advancing in telephony, and they have a, um, a full body of work on feeder interaction. Um, so uh, is it a, um, uh, a path um, people look at? Um, Maybe feature interaction is a way to look at that. This is one of the aspects. So um, when you look at um, a smartphones, you have a set of features that interact, and you can decide which one are compatible. And you can probably use the same techniques as that are used to the design of software for those uh, smartphones uh, to apply them to the protocol stack. The, the question is that um, it's not a feature selection and a feature interaction in the sense that you have more menus, but it's, uh, you interact with the data structure on the, on the protocol stack. And I would have to, to dig into that to see uh, whether we can apply that. I, I was thinking of things like, uh, for example, when you do, uh, let's say, um, 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 a call forwarding. You know, you do call forwarding, then you can have loops. And you do something else like, uh, I, mean, I mean, features in telephony could be interacting with each other. And if, if um, implemented uh, independently, they can create problems. Yes. So probably there is something to look at there, you know, with the automata and all the body of work that has been done in telecom. Yeah, I think the same so kind of, yeah. Clearly what we need to understand is that when we have an eBPF code that implements an extension, we need to have a way to abstract what the extension does and check whether it can conflict with yeah. the, the base protocol or with another extension. For example, if I decide as an eBPF extension to remove the retransmission of TCP, it will impact the reliable delivery of TCP. But if I combine that with an extension that implements forward erasure correction, then it's still compatible with a reliable delivery. But I don't have a model of what we expect from TCP. So if I have a model of what we expect from TCP, then I can, when I run an extension, I can check whether the extension is still compatible with the abstract model of TCP or of, an, of any other protocol. But there is work for people working on software automation. Or formal and methods. Formal or, methods and yeah. lots of things like that, yeah. yeah. Thank you very, very much for this nice presentation. It's already 10 and a half. I think we have to uh, conclude the session. Thank, Thank you. Very much. So uh, we, will give, we want to give you a, a small token of appreciation. First of all, uh, some kind of trophy for, you. <laughs> for accepting to be here and presenting this nice presentation. Thank you. And also, Nils uh, brought some few gifts, local Maybe. few gifts. Some chocolate. Some chocolate. Maybe. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And we have the uh, tradition the uh, in our faculty that every official speaker gets a mug. 
from University of Osnabrück and as we have to check you also again. So thank you. Thank you. So let's have a family picture. Yeah.